Welcome to Lithizim. Today's video is hosted by Sage Wagner, a highly skilled geologist and geophysicist who will guide you through the exciting world of geoscience. Join us as we explore Earth. have our field notes um, but you uh, you're familiar with those and then uh, the first thing I was just kind of kind of show you was uh, uh, and this may be uh, redundant but uh, using Pickwin um, to look at files I'm sorry not redundant so. okay okay um, so essentially just kind of like, uh, you know, let's like look at the wave itself and uh, we could uh, use geometric size module controller, uh, but uh, I think Piclin has a little bit better uh, filters and, and view uh, capacity. Um, so essentially, uh, yeah, so we're going to go to our desktop, um, open one of these files and uh, so and in that case, I, I collected two seconds with the idea that maybe there'd be some uh, like cultural noise that would add to the low frequency, the, the passive yeah. uh, elements. Uh, didn't really, pretty quiet sight. Um, but like the main thing just kind of to show you here. Uh, so kind of, you know, preparing to pick it for refraction. You know, you can see the, the first break pretty, pretty easily. Right. Um, and then the other elements that are kind of uh, characteristic is, you know, this might be uh, a air wave. So the air wave is always going to have a uh, linear velocity. So the, the, and we can test that by uh, clicking this little V velocity button. And uh, I don't know if you, you see that, but there's like this, uh, you know, and then says 12,000 feet per second. So it's, you know, I think it's the uh, speed uh, through air, mm -hmm. uh, something to that effect. Um, so it's like 1100, 1200 sounds fine. So I think that's the air wave. And then uh, beneath the P wave is this body here, this S wave package. Mm -hmm. And, um, Let's see if we can uh, stretch it out more. So air wave. Um, and so uh, we can then go to uh, test some filters. Um, and then a thing to point out is that our, our air wave is technically kind of like mixed in with our S wave. So our, our linear velocity is similar to our S wave velocity. And uh, that we might be able to see this uh, linear uh, feature on our dispersion curve. So hopefully we, we, we can see that. But um, in order to start filtering, um, I think it's uh, control plus, no, uh, L. Let's see, how do I get this? Yeah, I think uh, um, control L and control H. Yeah. L, L starts with the low frequency. I'm in this, like, you got to get in, like, an edit mode, or I exit, ed okay, there it is. I was in edit mode, I think, because I clicked on the velocity, mm. so then now I should be able to it's up here. Um, and then typically, and Bill, uh, Bill Black showed me this, so uh, let's see. So then put the L for the low frequency. I just remember like 16 was about where he went, okay. you know, so we don't, uh, and then as far as the, the high frequency, uh, I mean, 1000, like this is all really high frequency. We went down about like 260 to 10. This is about like, so like, this is kind of our, uh, band pass, you know, that we would, uh, and then it, you know, kind of cleaned up, you know, see here, maybe there's like this low frequency, uh, effect here. Yeah. Occasionally, uh, if the ground's wet, you know, the computer's right here, you'll see this high frequency, you know, static electric electric noise. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's just kind of, uh, 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 you know, a 
means to uh, estimate, you know, kind of to look at the, the wave package. So 3,000 for a uh, shear wave, you know, it's probably going to be about 1,000, 1,500 for the uh, shear S wave, um, which this is surface wave, and then we solve for shear wave. Um, okay, so then that's, that's about that. Um, so now we are familiar with our uh, wave trace. Um, now we open surf size. You have surf size uh, six? Yeah. Okay. You have surf size five also? Uh, doubtful. I don't think so. Okay. Well, uh, you may have IT uh, uh, download that for you at some point. Um, just because we have two dongles. We have this dongle, which is the newer dongle, and it works six. Mm -hmm. And then the other dongle five. is for five. Really, I mean, there, there's like uh, this, I, I'll teach you on six and you'll be able to use five. It's literally like, it's the same. Yeah. The only, there's just like a couple features that they added, um, you know, to be able to like do, do this. This is like uh, two dispersion curves yeah. merged together. So that's like their new, you know, selling thing. Um, so yeah, so then there's always like this message where it asks you, do you want to like resize, you know, and I don't know. For whatever reason, these guys like like their uh, uh, window in this like square, but I, I usually just blow it up. So the first thing you want to do is you convert uh, seg2 to KGS. I guess technically they're not seg2, but, uh, or are they? At least not embedded in the, uh, the file. Um, okay, so then we're gonna go desktop, MESW data, and I'm just gonna open our first one. Actually, uh, so the way that we collected, uh, we collected uh, three shot points on one end of the line, three shot points on the other end of the line. Uh, and so the furthest offset, you know, middle, closest, closest, middle, furthest. Um, and so then in an effort to process, you know, kind of a batch style, uh, I grab uh, the first three files, just all the shots on one end. Go to change, change the name. Uh, I usually do, um, uh, so I, you know, I can do 17,000 or I'm just gonna do 17. And then, uh, actually I'm gonna do 17,000 today. And then I do K and that just kind of stands for like this KGS format. But this is all just, you know, preference. And then underscore uh, one. And then to me, that just means like the left shot. And then two is going to be the right shot. So that's just like the designation that I, I use. Um, click run format. That reformats it. Um, and then I usually like will batch kind of like. So I did this this morning and I, I just did a like uh, that step for like step one and I did all, all the files I do the next one uh, I just find it to be you know bo more boring but like better productivity uh, just like batching it so same thing um, and there's a reason why we can't uh, run all of these together um, and it's just kind of uh, uh, the way that the uh, geometry is assigned uh, to these files. So we open uh, geometry, open side of the data file. Um, I'll tell you information about it. One sampling interval is one millisecond. I always remember like a one to one. So one millisecond, one record length. It has to be one record length. If you do like a half second, uh, surf size will auto uh, uh, add a half second. Uh, I believe. Yeah, if you have more than a second, then that's fine. Um, and so I chose two seconds. Um, so, okay, uh, this is active. Um, so then this automatically pops up. Um, so we have our source, uh, the distance, uh, our offset distance, and then geophone spacing. And then we assign stations to uh, each geophone. So I usually do like 101, and then you click tab, and then it like so. You, uh, in this this 
it's nice to use tab then it just auto populates it right so now I tab again and it brings me down to this distance well the first one was uh, 36 and even though um, in uh, when we re uh, recorded the data I assigned geophone uh, 1 to be x equals 0 mm -hmm. but uh, that uh, designation isn't uh, used here like it is it is in uh, size imager uh, and otherwise in other words uh, you know, we're, we're not necessarily tracking uh, our X. It just re results in a 1D uh, oh, okay. uh, data set. And then we, you know, did, you know, uh, put it where it should be. Um, so then uh, once again, tab, and then I got six. Um, now notice here, um, we shot from left to right, uh, from the low phones to the high phones. And then here, this is the source location. Um, notice that it uh, is a thousand to a thousand two. So that means um, we skipped a station. So these are six foot stations. And so uh, I think it's default that it, it, it always uh, uh, assumes that you uh, did, you know, you're moving at two stations. Uh, so I just click OK. Um, and then you can save to a separate file, but I've honestly, I haven't done that anymore. I just click apply geometry and it just like resaves over that, uh, that first file we've made. Yeah. And then, uh, this is important to review this little table it makes. So once again, 101, that's our station we designated. Number one is our first geophone. And then, uh, are three shots. So what I usually do to ensure that uh, everything's correct is uh, I go like one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm like, okay, yeah, that's right. 36 feet, six stations to uh, to phone one. And then uh, notice here, two stations skipped. And then uh, you know, so that looks right to me. Um, let's open up the other one. Um, and now. Uh, we're going to be coming from uh, the other side. Um, so then here for our first, uh, we do 124. Once again, we tab, and then it, it uh, it's kind of confused because it's supposed to be in order because uh, it says 102 to 124. So I click OK, and then I switch that to 123. Tab again, and then it takes it. So it's now it's going. Uh, now it's assigning them in order. Uh, 126 is our, our first shot point, 12 uh, foot off that. Um, but then, um, okay, so we're shooting this way, but notice this thing thinks that our shot point is moving uh, into our line, when yeah. in fact it's moving away, so we have to click that. Um, so that looks right. Um, here it says records per location. So in the field, we stacked our data. However, uh, KGS recommends to not stack your data. And eventually I'll probably implement that, but uh, we've traditionally always stacked, um, even from MASW. But the reason you don't have to stack here is because um, basically we can say, okay, 1704, 1706, that's, uh, so there's three records per location. Right, so we took we assigned that four stacks, and then it would it would uh, take those four files, and the next four files are for uh, the next uh, shot point location. But um, we uh, not today. So click OK, apply geometry. Same thing. Um, scroll down to the end, and just give it a, a visual look. That looks good. Um, so so now we're we're good. So. Um, I guess um, there is an edit data, edit data step, um, but that you, I typically don't edit the, the data, meaning like uh, cutting uh, the P wave off or like trying to filter anything. Um, I usually do that uh, only if the data is really, really bad and it's kind of like you require to recover it. 
Um, and, I'll, and I'll show you why, because uh, I, I want to see all this information. Um, I believe it helps you interpret. Um, and, um, but theoretically you suppress the uh, P wave, you know, you should be able to get a better image of the dispersion curve. So uh, up here, and the, the menu system's kind of quirky. So it's like you can almost accommodate everything using the buttons or you can just like use the drop down menu. I probably just, you know, use both. Um, so let's, let's click on this, uh, skip this single record dispersion curve analysis. That's like from, you know, Surface Act 3 or, you know, now there, there's this uh, multiple record analysis, you know, so that's kind of the, uh, where we're at today is, uh, so make dispersion curve image. Um, so I click my, uh, my file with the geometry applied. So here, um, phase velocity, frequency overtone generator. Um, Typically, uh, I just click this use last parameters. And so I want to ensure that these parameters are set because the default ones are, uh, they're okay, but, uh, you know, not great. Um, so let's, 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 uh, let's start over doing it again, just so I can show you what, uh, I did change. Um, um, okay. And so essentially the default is, uh, the frequency five to 50. Um, and then, uh, velocity 10 to 6,000. Um, so for here, if I, I, I usually do a hundred, you know, like 80 to hundred. I just like to see, you know, maybe you get something out there. Who knows? It doesn't hurt in my opinion, but, um, 6,000 is pretty fast. It's for VS, right? Like that's okay. probably like 20,000 VP at, at least. So, uh, I usually put that down and then there's this, uh, interval, and it's kind of like how many uh, data points are you going to use to uh, create your dispersion curve image, overtone hey, image. Noah. And uh, overall, uh, I tend to use these uh, parameters. So I just kind of put it down to 4,000 uh, feet per second for my max velocity. Um, interval of 10. And then uh, a half interval here. This stuff is less important, but... Uh, Another thing to note is uh, we, we uh, pull it down to low. So it says a higher contrast will make strongest dispersion curve energy more prominent. Um, so actually, uh, we're, we kind of uh, use the opposite of this. So um, it, uh, this really pulls out the dispersion curve and is it helps uh, for uh, modal uh, separation. So you know that, uh, your higher modes, you know, you're not mixing your fundamental modes with your higher modes. Um, stack, same mid station OT, OT stands for overtone. And so once again, if we, if we, uh, we put our three records in, we apply the geometry and then I'm actually going to like stack, uh, all three of our shot points from the, the diff, the different distances. And, and I'm doing that just to, you know, each, uh, when I have a different offset, I'm uh, sampling, you know, slightly a different frequency range. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I like to think that I'm kind of getting a, a wider range of frequencies. And so I use this stack, same mid-station OT. Um, so start processing. Um, creates this uh, active OT dot, uh, DAT file. Um, so let's just go ahead and uh, uh, let's make our other one. And um, yeah, so we can do, uh, just for sake, um, there's also this records and algorithm uh, tab. This is more like advanced functionality, I would say, um, as far as like, um, so there's this approximate, and that's uh, using um, phase velocity method. Um, whereas there's this other uh, algorithm, uh, HRLRT, high resolution linear radon transform. Um, there's some papers, some uses uh, for that. That's uh, Kansas really was hyping up 
uh, that. Yeah. I don't know if, if they probably talked about that in your class. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I haven't really found an instance where this really like saved the day. Um, but, you know, perhaps a, a little bit more research, being more academic with this uh, surveying, uh, maybe you could find the use case. But um, I've tried. Um, that being said, though, uh, sometimes maybe like it actually can work surprisingly well with passive data. Um, and it specifically is best for uh, the uh, higher frequencies. So in this in this image right here, what what they did is they they used a, an approximate, which is the default to uh, image like zero to 15. Mm -hmm. And then they use this uh, HRLRT for this uh, high frequency stuff, the, uh, the stick of the hockey hockey puck, hockey stick, right? Um, so now we go to uh, multi-dispersion. Um, I think you could click that button to make and also pick uh, a, a dispersion curve. So we open up our uh, dispersion curve. Um, okay, I mean, this looks uh, decent. Um, I'm kind of uh, wondering, I thought the one that I had earlier uh, looked a little bit different. Um, and so uh, it when you run the, uh, Inversion, it saves uh, uh, an image of the uh, dispersion curve. I guess, actually, that's okay. So this is my pick from earlier. So, okay. So we're good. Now, um, I, I saw it on another record, but maybe not here. Um, but, like, you see these, uh, this is our dispersion curve, and then we kind of got these other higher modes that are like barely coming in. But um, there's sometimes there's like this like kind of a circular looking uh, blob like uh, up in the upper right. And I believe that that's actually a refraction uh, energy. Um, and then let's see here. There's a couple buttons um, that you can check out. So there's this air button. And what that does is it draws uh, uh, this little line at 11,000 feet per second where, or see it says 11, 12, 8. Yeah. Um, so then maybe, you know, there's a little bit of energy here. Um, but some, some cases you'll see a nice, uh, uh, horizontal, uh, signal and it can be confused, you know, with the actual uh, signal itself. So I think that's why this little button's there. Um, and then there's these other ones, but these are, uh, they, they talked about those in the class and are, uh, you know, maybe we could talk about those after. Um, so I click my um, bounds. Let's see, it should not be any marked. Okay. Uh, let's start over. Um, so I click this bounds button. Um, you like to import less, you know, sure. Um, so then I, I uh, select this because um, I want to just redo it. Um, and and uh, so then uh, you took the course, so you know, this is all you know, pretty straightforward. Um, and then I usually pick till, uh, till you know. Uh, until you can't no more. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit more liberal in my picking. Um, you know, I, I kind of think like, uh, I've seen dispersion curves. I know what dispersion curves are supposed to look like. Um, rather than like being con very conservative and then kind of just like allowing the software to kind of like, uh, make those decisions. I believe that, uh, uh, so this, uh, in this case, you know, maybe you can argue 
you know, this one isn't really clear, but in other cases, you'll see like this light blue and it'll kind of follow. Yeah. So, you know, the, the thing to think about is, you know, our frequencies is uh, pretty much uh, our depth, right? And so as we go in this terrain, um, you're basically, you know, this is like one foot, you know, three foot, you know, five feet, you know, 10 feet, you know, 25 feet. And then it kind of quickly, uh, uh, I don't know if it's exponential, but uh, the depth increases with uh, lower frequency. And uh, so my point being is, there's kind of like this quirk with uh, MESW, the, the processing, where um, sometimes it gives you uh, a false velocity inversion at uh, like within the upper 10 feet. Okay. And so with that knowledge, I, I try to like say, okay, well, you know, uh, more than likely it's, it's, you know, it's going to be consistent. And so it's, it should have like a, this... Uh, linear um, line, you know, it should basically like a, a, a you know, landing ramp is kind of, you know, we're, we're landing a plane, you know, is, is kind of like the way that I think about it. But in this case, I, I'm not going to draw that one out like that, but that's where I have it. Uh, you go to controls, um, curve extraction. Um, I use, once again, last settings. So I, I added, uh, it's about 20 data points. And uh, the curve smoothing is at nine. Uh, we'll we'll play with that a little bit. Um, not sure what this means. Equal wavelength frequency interval. Oh, that's uh, what, how it places the um, the dots. Um, seems like it makes them closer at lower frequency, and then it kind of uh, increases the distance between them as you get to the higher frequency. Um, so we click that and we click extract DC. Now, you know, that does a, that did a really good job. Um, and this thing has a pretty good kind of like auto picking, uh, you know, it's gonna uh, try to hit this uh, uh, max uh, amplitude uh, up here, this, uh, the darker colors. Um, but what I've been finding is um, it really does this, lo this lower frequency stuff really good. Um, but it doesn't capture this uh, kind of increase. And uh, if I were to just do it like this, um, that's fine. That's a valid interpretation. But um, if I want to kind of, you know, I may get like 75 feet of deep depth, you know. So maybe if I were to just kind of like take those away and then give it more of a, a exponential kind of, a, you know, a growth there. Um, so that, that's kind of the routine that I go with is I usually take these first couple off and then I, I draw them myself. Um, technically, um, we can turn these things on and, uh, you know, you can argue that uh, some of them are uh, helpful. Um, it's like something to do with uh, using aliasing velocities, spatial aliasing to... Uh, to help pick the dispersion curve. This came from, you know, research uh, versus uh, actual application, I believe. And so theoretically, technically, um, uh, the other modes should come in between these lines. So basically that one looks all right. You know, um, yeah, I'm not sure about that, but uh, they talk about that in the class and, uh, so we save the DC. Um, I usually go straight into the inversion. Otherwise, then you're going to have to open it up again. Um, now, um, I ran these earlier and uh, I got, uh, well, we'll just do it. I'll, I'll run. Um, so, um, so see here, it, it, it kind of gave this, uh, you know, low velocity. It could be real, but... Uh... Thank you for watching. We at Lithizim appreciate your support. It is with great pleasure that we get to bring you these videos about geology, geophysics, GIS, and computer science. Until next time.